Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest version of uh, Tales, Tales from Tales, Outer Tales, Space, Tales, Space, Tales, Space, where I take an HFY story from somewhere around the internet and read it aloud for your enjoyment. All the relevant links are down below. Like, subscribe, and all that YouTube comf to help this video and channel grow. Anyways, as always, I hope that you enjoy. I would just like to thank the following tier 5 patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. Data Magnet and Bob the Dragon. Thank you again. And now, on to the story. Story number one. We didn't need slaves. Written by Dan and Angel. We didn't need slaves. We spouted off some things about needing to keep the other sentient species down. So then they couldn't threaten us. Maybe a few of the most gullible believed it. Slaves cost more in care and security than basic AI. But that was the point. They were a status symbol as a society and with the wealthier individuals, we could afford to waste resources on slaves. Anyone could get an AI assistant, but only the elite could use real creatures. When we found the humans, we already had four other species under our control. One of them we had almost destroyed when they refused to surrender. We thought we knew what we were doing. How could a primitive race oppose us? After all, we were the masters. Our usual strategy worked wonders. Our fleet circles the planet, destroyed their satellites and space stations, then created half the moon with near light speed metal projectiles. An hour later, we told them that they could surrender. Pay a yearly tithe in slaves and live under our strict restrictions or die. They deliberated amongst themselves for one of their days and made a request. They would provide us with slaves, but they would not be killed or maimed out of hand or be put to work in hard labor. If we agreed, they would give us the useful people, intelligent and obedient ones, who could do clerical work and help in the home or office. In the past, two of our slave species had tried to give us their weak, unintelligent, and violent. We had to waste time dealing with the useless slaves, and then show the species the error of their ways. If we could get useful slaves without force, we'd happily accept. Also, there was little point in killing a slave needlessly. How could you show them off if they were dead? <laughs> so we laughed amongst ourselves and made it seem like we were doing them a great honor. They also asked if they could have their people become soldiers. We refused. We weren't stupid enough to give them weapons. One human year later, we received our first shipment of 15 million slaves. The humans hadn't lied. They'd given us many smart and obedient slaves. We taught them our language and made sure they knew what would happen if they disobeyed. Then we sold them to businesses and families. The personal assistants were particularly favored once we learned how useful they could be. But really, all of them were sold for a top price. The butlers, nannies, and maids were all already well trained. We barely needed to do anything beyond teaching them how to run the appliances and basic biology. The secretaries, janitors, drivers, and the rest all worked harder than our paid workers. It was like they were born to serve us. When the next tithe of 15 million arrived, there were fights as people rushed to buy them. We demanded 25 million the next year, and the humans meekly agreed. Within 10 years, anyone who was important had a human personal assistant. Businesses were teaching human technicians how to work with our AI. Every important family had a human servant. A few businesses were letting humans help negotiate contracts after we learned about their lawyers. And soon after, we learned why they were so happy to help. We had watched them carefully for the first five years, but then we grew lazy. What was the point of having slaves if you spent all your time watching everything that they did? As long as they did their job, everything would be fine and any large mistake or problem would be found quickly enough. And at least, that's what we thought. On the 15th anniversary of receiving our first human slaves, chaos struck. First, there was financial, 
Credits, resources, and entire companies were moved around seemingly at random. Entire planets were sold for a handful of credits. And a used ground transport was bought for billions of credits. Companies sold themselves off to the thousand different buyers who broke them up into even smaller pieces and sold them again. Everything was done with complete authority of the owners. And during all of this, many key members of the banks and financial world vanished. We faced an economic collapse. The government almost dealt with that. They were on the verge of shutting everything down and damned the consequences when the power went out. All across our planets and space habitat systems shut down. Power was lost, AI refused orders, waste disposal stopped, and navigation systems failed. With panic and confusion already high, this pushed people over the edge. There were riots, suicides, assaults, and murder. Many of our slaves joined in the chaos and began to attack us with a vengeance and a hatred that we hadn't thought possible. Despite all of that, we could still recover. But then, the humans showed their hand. The nannies and caretakers took the children and the elderly and vanished with them. These were the families of the elite. They didn't care what happened to the lower classes. They wanted their children and parents back. And while this was happening, the assassins struck. Government officials, scientists, army officers, social elites, the business people, bankers and financial experts who hadn't disappeared were slaughtered by explosion, by car crash, by poison, by knife, by hand. Many humans had nothing to do with the killings. They were busy causing a bloodless chaos or in hiding. Still, out of the hundreds of millions of humans in our cities and homes, there were several million who were more than willing to get their hands dirty. We were headless. The leaders who were still alive were terrified of what would happen to their children, and paranoid that they were going to be stabbed in the back. There was a rapidly expanding slave revolt. Our cities were on fire, with fighting in the streets. The humans had largely slipped away to the pre-planned strongholds with complete access to our AIs, which even we didn't have at that point. Our soldiers were being sent contradictory orders, sending them in circles, bombing rebel strongholds, only to find out they had destroyed vital infrastructure or secure areas for officials, and wasting as many resources as possible. We thought that it couldn't get any worse. We were wrong. Humans took control of most of our habitats and several transport ships. Our communications cleared up long enough to hear their demands. We would surrender or the space habitats would lose their air, and the transport ships would ram our planets at FTL speed. If we surrendered, we would be granted mercy. We surrendered. Our military abandoned their warships and weapons, which the humans quickly took over. After they had our weapons, they kept their word and showed us mercy. The viruses that had destroyed our AI were disabled. They stopped using the tools of our elites to tear our system apart. They stopped getting our few remaining leaders. And then they returned our children and elders, who had been kept safely out of the way. Now we were but a shadow of what we were. Planet Power was only a fraction of our former merchant ships. We were trying to repair the damage the humans did to our society during the days of chaos. But much of our resources are gone. They were sent to the slave species as compensation. We could only watch as the humans fly our ships between the stars, keeping the peace, keeping our former slaves from slaughtering us. We didn't need slaves. We took them anyways. Ultimately, it destroyed us. End of story. Story number two. The contract written by Can You Change Usernames? So, uh, all of that is a suit, asked the interviewer, concluding the meeting. It's a Mark 17 resistance suit, replied Sam. And it simulates gravity of your planet. Not quite, Sam chuckled. Human physiology is highly adaptive. Our bodies will try and regulate muscle mass to the environment that we're in. 
In low gravity and in zero-g environments, our muscle mass will atrophy to help conserve metabolic resources. These suits are made from elastic materials that help us maintain mass during extended time on other than Terran environments. They also help us avoid embarrassing moments of overexertion. Embarrassing? How? asked the Xeno interviewer. Sam smiled, remembering his first time in low gravity without the Mark 17. Then he regretted it immediately. The smile had bared his teeth in what galactic communities considered a threat of immediate violence. Since the interviewer was behind three inch thick plane of transparent metal, it only flinched away. Had there been no barrier, the interviewing being probably would have fled in terror. Sam yawned, careful not to show his teeth, a gesture he had been taught that the species used both as an apology and as a demonstration of non-hostility. Please forgive me, Sam said, looking away from the being that resembled an armadillo crossed with a cow. That is a smile, and humans use them to express humor or joy. This is a fun memory for me, and I meant no threat. We have no quarrel, said the interviewer. I was informed that might happen. It was rude of me to recoil. Being this close to a predatory species that had survived the Great Falter was nerve-wracking for the being, and musky sweat had already begun to beat on his nose. The interviewer hoped that the human hadn't noticed as he fought a nervous tick to lick the sweat away from habit. As I was saying, uh, I remember being in a low-gravity environment like yours when I first hit the fleet. I had removed my suit to shower and conduct hygiene practices. As I stood up from my chair without magnetic boots and the suit, I launched myself into the ceiling of my hab room. <laughs> the repairs in the hab were expensive, and my head hurt for a day after. And this was amusing to you? The interviewer asked, astonished. Sam did not say what else was amusing to him. That the suit had an override function to stop resistance, and that it doubled as a protective armor that the thin layer of gel insulation would rigidize under ballistic force, dissipate most hand-portable heat and ray projections, and mask heat and IR signatures to ambient temperatures. That information was protected at all costs. The Mark 17 battlesuit's function as a preliminary protection for atrophy was a secondary feature that was all any Xeno needed to know at this point. Humans and their background made most Xenos uncomfortable, to the point that the nickname Death Wilders had stuck. It was intended as an insult, but most of humanity had adopted the name as a mark of pride to the point that many mercenary groups had named themselves for it. Of course, the official military and government groups publicly denounced the name and the groups that used it. The contracting association that had sent Sam and his team to this outpost were hoping that this interview would result in a hefty security contract for the outpost and many like it. It was funny later, Sam lamented. Kind of a rite of passage that happens to anyone that works in my field long enough. It's an amusing mistake that most people only make once. The interviewer shook his massive head in disbelief, standing up. The interview would be nearly twice as tall as the human, but if the reports were true, the small mammal in front of him had the raw strength to throw him many standard units or simply pull him apart. This was unnerving. There was no question that the company the interview worked for would benefit from accepting the human's bid for the outpost security contract, but it would certainly be difficult adjustment for the on-site workers. I think that's all the data we need to move forward, said the interviewer, slowly standing and yawning. Our officers will send over the agreement forms and terms by the end of the solar cycle. We look forward to having you and your team on board. Sam smiled in intentionally toothy grin as he rose, reinforcing as many stereotypes as he could at once. This was as much a personal pride as it was for marketing for him. The rates these men would get for a one-year contract would ensure neither him nor his children would have to work ever again. You'll be happy you made this decision. The metal barrier went opaque almost before the interviewer turned and ran from the room across from Sam. End of story.
And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.